Thank you very much. Um, so, thank you very much for showing up. I appreciate having a large, a large audience, and I think we succeeded. Um, so, who liked Vijay's talk this morning? Come on, everybody, right? It was, it was wonderful. I thought it was really inspiring and very exciting. Um, the thing that I find, which, uh, as, a, as a tool provider, as a service provider, is that uh, this is great stuff and it has a lot of complexity in it, but it's also a little circumstantial to fly all these swarms of robots around. And so, one of the things that I would like to do here is give you a, a smaller example and, and, uh, in, a, in a completely in a computational sense. So I would really like to leverage the value of computation in terms of doing your design. And, and what I'd like to do is remove a lot of the complexities that you saw this morning while preserving a lot of the key issues uh, that, that you find in such systems, in such cyber-physical systems. Um, and then on, on that topic, uh, in, the, in the title of my talk, I wanted to just highlight this notion of, of opening the world up. Right? So a lot of times you get people you know, ask you, at least I have this all the time, what is the difference between a cyber-physical system and a network embedded system? And, and to me, the key difference is really the openness of the system. And that's what I would like to uh, discuss here and then show you how, even in a, in a virtual environment, you can, you can preserve a lot of the, the difficulties that you will run into once you go to a, to a physical implementation. So here's a little system that I built. And um, I, I sort of, I, I wanted to call this a Tower of Nagy, because that's where MapWorks is headquartered, but, but my boss didn't like it. So this is really uh, the Towers of Hanoi uh, as a SCADA system, a supervisory control and data acquisition. And so I may have a stack of blocks that comes in, and I have a machine that will pick up a block and move it over, it can move it over to the center, or it can move it over to the final position. And ultimately, uh, I wanted to get a certain ordering out. And originally I had red, green, uh, or yet red, yellow, and blue after the painting by uh, uh, Stuart Burnett, the, the, who's afraid of red, yellow, and green painting, but then I figured maybe for engineers I should use RGB, red, red, green, and blue. So, so you'll find RGB from, the, from here on out. Uh, but so this is essentially uh, a system that we have been building for a long time. SCADA system. It has uh, feedback control uh, for, for moving your, your uh, basically your nozzle, your, your slider uh, in the horizontal direction. And then uh, in my in my case, I use feed forward control because I have to be able to very quickly pick up these blocks. Uh, this is a representation, if you will, of a printed circuit board uh, machine, as a, as a surface mount surface mount device machine, where you operate in, in the order of milliseconds, right? So I feed forward control to move up and down, feed back control to move back and forth, uh, and uh, and an operator will turn this thing on and say, okay, perform this re recipe to sort these blocks. And you can create a model of that, and here's a model that in Simulink, where I have a model of the physics, and uh, I model this in, in a fair amount of detail with, with the actual airflow around the blocks. And, and if you run it, you'll actually see the blocks getting sucked up. Uh, and, and move. And if you move too quickly, the block will actually fall. So the physical world has, has quite some detail in it to, to be authentic to, to the designer. Um, and then there's a, a network that you can model with some, uh, some processing logic associated with it uh, that will control the, the horizontal and vertical motion, as well as the pump to actually uh, pick up the block, create the airflow. And, and so I wanted to make this a cyber-physical system. And I built this thing, uh, basically as a mental exercise, can I do this? Uh, and uh, I was talking with uh, Justina Tsalma, who is a, a collaborator of mine, uh, and we were discussing how could this become a cyber-physical system. And so she came up with the idea of, well, why don't you take those blocks and make those blocks smart? So I put in a little extra functionality, actually quite a bit of extra functionality, where each of these blocks has their own microprocessor. And to maybe conceptualize that, think of it as your phone. So it could be your cell phone. Uh, and, and I actually also use the, the fact that there's a little camera that, that is looking up. So these blocks have some sensory information. They know if they're on top of the stack or not. Uh, and they have some, some uh, microprocessor that will, that will now, over the network, be able to communicate with my machine. So, it's not that there's an operator anymore who runs down a pre-specified pre batch process, sequence control that does this. No, what I now have is these blocks communicating with the machine who is basically providing a service. And, and the service is I can move you, I can pick you up, I can move you, and I can place you. And so we can then start looking inside of these blocks. So to me, this is really a cyber-physical system in that I now have a system where blocks can come into the overall system and I have to, in order to implement my functionality, in order to implement my feature functionality, I have to actually collaborate as the machine with some pretty sophisticated logic with each of the blocks, which all have pretty sophisticated logic on them as local controllers. And so now you really start feeling what the pain is in these cyber-physical systems. 
Uh, here's one example that I've highlighted. I have, for example, my red block, and my red block has a local plan. And the local plan is, if you can, if I see that I'm on top somewhere, if I have, if my camera I see that I'm on top, move me one spot over. Then, after you're done, relinquish control, do what you want to do. If you come back to me, move me a spot back. And then, after you've moved me back, move me two spots over, because the red block wants to be on top. So the red block basically has a control locally that, that gives as much opportunity to the other blocks as possible to get to find their way to the right spot. So the red block goes through, uh, through three stages. Uh, it first says, move me one over to the left. Well, for you, this is right. Move me one over to the left. Move me two over to the right. And, and, and if you look at the other blocks, for example, the blue block has to be at the bottom, has a very simple plan. If you can move me, always move me right to the end. And so you can start composing these control laws, and if you, if you execute, you'll see that the emerging behavior, that ultimately what comes out, is a sort of order. Right? Um, so I'm running kind of low on time, so I should probably not, very quickly, this here has to communicate with the machine when the machine tells when it is done performing a move action. And then the block goes into the next phase of its plan. But if the, if the, if the block doesn't wait for the machine to reset this acknowledgement that it was done moving it, then it goes into the next stage, it still thinks it's done moving, and it will immediately go to the next stage. So the synchronization on concurrent resources is something they can really start to feel in, in, in these situations. The other thing you'll find is that this opens in a vertical sense. So these, these computations that I run here, I have specified in a functional high-level sense, and it's not a given what platform will be running underneath. So you really want to be, be able to adapt to different architectures in a very flexible way. Uh, and so you could, for example, have a configuration mechanism that lets you say, these input output ports should be mapped onto these uh, explicit receive, you know, publish, subscribe, uh, send, receive protocols that, for example, I will find in Autosar. So these platforms also have to be modeled and you have to be able to connect up with them. In the sense that if I do my image processing, because I have stereoscopic vision built in, to find out where the block, the stack of blocks originally is. So there's two cameras that process a video stream, and they try to find where this, this stack of blocks is. Again, to Vijay's talk this morning, we're trying to create a, a, a model of our environment. Um, and of course, that image processing is highly intensive, but it's extremely parallel. It's embarrassing parallel. I, I run a lot, of, a, a lot of comparisons over two video images. And I can run that, I can model that as a parallel operation without saying anything about the platform. And then if I execute it, because I've indicated that this is completely parallel, I can see that my machine is actually starting to load however many cores I, I have uh, allocated to this particular process. So you have to be able to op be open to these, uh, these different platforms. Here you'll see something that is really important, which is the timing that you have to deal with. My position measurement for the feedback control comes in at 5 milliseconds. My video stream comes in at 100 milliseconds because it's a very complex, it's a very uh, computationally intense computation, 10 frames per second. Now, if I go all the way down to my stereo analysis, and I use my position measurement and my video stream, because I've gone through a bunch of, say, double buffering schemes to maintain determinism, the video frame that I'm analyzing is perhaps 100 milliseconds old, whereas the position measurements that I get are maybe five seconds old. So if I now determine, based on my video analysis, that I found my stack of blocks and I grab my position, I'm off. I'm off in five seconds, milliseconds. And so what you'll see is that instead of being right on the nose, you're actually off. And it could, that could be potentially disastrous, right? So again, these timing effects that you will find in, in the system that video showed this morning, you can actually create in a virtual world as well. So what you see here, in, in comparison, you, you start to really work with uh, labeled and unlabeled agents. These are the uh, principal label because they have a color that determines your behavior. But you can think of many other things you could do. You could, for, for example, think of these blocks as being smart blocks that want to go build a structure themselves. So they have their own plan of where they should go in the structure. Um, you use the image processing to map your environment. You have to navigate obstacles. And in fact, you, you create these optical obstacles yourself, potentially. Because if I think of energy efficiency, I may not want to pick up a block on the way. If I can move my block as, with, with as low an elevation as possible, I should do that. But if I put a block somewhere else, I might bump into it. But I put that block there myself. So the planning can become very, very complicated. Um, 
And then, of course, I talked about the different control loops that you have. The service routine run, runs at a slower rate than, than actually the feedback control. So all these issues you will find in here. So then if you look at what a challenge is if you go CPS, if you start opening up your embedded world, well, you have to deal with these multi-rate distributed architectures that I've talked about. Uh, you have to find out a way to synchronize across all this asynchronous, uh, this asynchronous uh, confusion, if you will, network, uh, complications, task scheduling, all sorts of stuff. Um, you want to be able to design this emerging behavior. This is something that Peter brought out explicitly, is how can I synthesize these local control laws? I know what I want in the end. How can I now figure out what these washings should say individually? How can I synthesize that? How can I analyze that? How can I synthesize that? Um, and, and how can I design that? How do I even get insight into what that should look like? Um, the modeling of an implementation platform in such a way that I can conveniently open up in, in, to, towards the bottom. Uh, and so I want to have robust open interfaces. Uh, that means that the protocol has to be such that if I hook into someone else who is providing the service, that has to be a robust service uh, provider. Uh, in my system, I actually have to build in dynamic priorities. So the red block may have a high priority for the first move, but then before it takes on the second move, it may actually, it may actually come down in priority. So other blocks can intersperse their behavior. So now you have a system that has dynamic priorities built in. Very challenging. And of course, the security across the cyber and physical world. You can think of a malicious block that sits underneath another block, and the, uh, the block or it sits on top of another block, and the block it sits on top of may have the key to get into the service, and the block on top may not. But if it can spoof the system by, by making the block underneath believe that it is that it's free to be picked up, the machine will come over and pick up the block underneath, but it's picking up the wrong one. Right? So, so this is really where you're seeing that, that cyber physical security is, is not the same as uh, cyber security. The, the, the communication can be completely entrusted, but it's not a given that you do the right thing. Um, and then you've seen that you have all these different features that you have to connect and compose with each other. Uh, the, the, the image, the, the stereoscopic vision, the video stream has to connect with the feedback control. And in fact, if I turn, if I change my feedback controller, which for which I use Dodge and loop shaping, if I use different gain values, my slider will move faster, my video stream will come in at a different rate. And all of a sudden I have to recalibrate my detection of this stack because I get different values out from my, from my real world. So all these things you will find in here. Um, and I have a few more slides, but I should probably stop here. So if you, uh, if you want to know what's on the rest here, you can grab me when I'm outside. Uh, please do, because I enjoy talking about this. Thank you.